Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Licentiate of Engineering Defense Seminar. My name is Matt Segmant, and I am the technical leader at Solvacos, but also an adjunct assistant professor here at ATH. And the student that should defend his thesis, Licentiate of Engineering Thesis, is Alexander Bobo. And the title you have the presentation Failure Prediction of Complex Load Cases in Sheet Metal Forming. The opponent is Professor Carl Brian Nielsen, working at Vestas Aircoil in Denmark and also the Sydansk Universitet. The supervisors have been Johan Piltama from Olvokas and BTH, Shafikul Islam from BTH, and myself. And the head supervisor and examiner is Professor Tobias Larsson. First, a few words about the licentiate of engineering degree. It's a degree in the Swedish system between a master and a full PhD. It consists of 120 credits and roughly two to two and a half year, years of work. Since both the opponent and the respondent are Danish, we thought of doing this in Dansk. <laughs> but unfortunately, the rule says either Swedish or English, so we will stick to Swedish. <laughs> the procedure will be as follows. Alexander will give 30 minutes, get 30 minutes roughly to present what he has done. We take a short break to rearrange for the discussion. And Professor Nielsen gets as long as you want. If we want the lunch break, we take that and continue after that. <laughs> Once he's finished, I will give the word to the people online to ask questions. And least, last but not least, the people here in the room. After that, the examiner will find, call a decision. If it's passed, Alexander will get his degree and we will go upstairs to have cake and beer. If not, we... Yeah. yeah, we just have beer. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I give the word to Alexander. Please start. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, before we get started, I have one thing to address in the published thesis, and that is on page 44 in equation 6.2. I have made a typo in the expression for the effective plastic strain of the uh, von Mises constitutive model, where in the thesis it states that it should be four over two, but it should in fact be four over three. This is merely a typo and the correct expression has been used for all calculations in the thesis and in the results. So with that out of the way, um, we can get started on the interesting stuff today. For the next roughly half an hour, I'll be taking you through the work that I've been doing for the past two years on the topic of complex load cases in sheet metal forming. I'll start out with some motivation for why are we, why is this kind of research interesting? A little bit of background knowledge. And after that, I'll present the research questions that has been the center of my research. After that, going through three complex load cases being nonlinear strain paths, stretch bending, edge effects, and finally wrapping it in everything up with a conclusion and some outlook on the research. So why is it important to do this kind of research that I have been doing? Uh, in order to, to answer that question, we must start by looking at what is uh, sheet metal forming. So the sheet metal forming process can be split into overall three main steps. Um, the first step is, of course, a material selection. We have decided to manufacture a component and we need some sort of material to do so. In sheet metal forming, these uh, materials come in large coils, which can often be several hundred meters long. So before we can manipulate the material into final geometries, we need to cut them down into even smaller um, pieces, uh, which can be handled. And that happens in what we call the blanking process. So after this banking process, we are now ready to actually stamp the panel in a press. Here it's simplified by a single press. In reality, it's most likely a pressed line having multiple forming and trimming operations. Um, and finally, we have uh, a um, final geometry or final component 
here exemplified by the automotive car body. So when designing these kind of um, processes here, one thing that we would like to do is to do a manufacturing feasibility study, because before manufacturing all the tools that we need to do this, we want to have a very, very good idea of, well, can this actually happen in real life or are we going to experience a lot of trouble or problems or trouble? Uh, so we like to sort that out before investing a couple of hundred millions. Um, so in this manuf manufacturing feasibility study, what we do is work with digital models. And these digital models can, I've tried to simplify a little bit here what we're trying to do. So if we take reality, that is some sort of expressed as a variable over time, it changes as, as time goes by. Um, what we are trying to do is to generate a physics-based model that is as close to reality as possible in order to say something clever about the process we're trying to validate. As you can see, they don't quite overlap, which means that there is some part of reality that our um, model ignores. So what is the benefits of actually having these uh, digital models here? Well, it is a known fact that when we have an accurate model that is very, very close to reality, we see a decrease in development time for new components. In the sheet metal form context, um, we can reduce the scrap rates because we have more control over the process, meaning we can push the material a little further than we maybe would have if we had a more unlikely or untrustworthy model. And finally, when we have these good models, we can also uh, reduce the uh, time spent on um, fixing errors in production. So we can go back and run any root code analysis in the digital world and then try out the, uh, the solutions. Now, with the changes in society today, uh, and especially within the automotive industry, just um, the form community is facing a lot of challenges. Uh, there are demands for reduction of carbon emissions through lightweight structures in the automotive industry, introduction of more advanced materials that are more sustainable materials. Um, we want, the customers want more aesthetic and complex car bodies to, to, to please the visual aspect of buying and driving a car. Of course, we need to think about improved car safety, improved production process. How can we do this faster, smarter, cheaper? Improved driving characteristics. You want to drive a nice car. And finally, of course, reduce the costs because that's what it's all about in big business. Keep the costs low. With all these challenges, what we're seeing is a shift in our models so that our physics-based model becomes further from reality and the part of the reality that the model ignores increases. So therefore, we want to do some research on how can we actually model these complex phenomena that is caused by these challenges. So a little bit of background about how we make these models. So when we talk about these digital models here, for, for my sake, this is done in finite elements and in the finite elements software world. And in order to set up a simulation in the finite elements uh, environment, we need three key inputs. The first one is the material parameters that describe how the material that we put into the press behaves when it's deformed and stretched and with several speeds and so on. Second part is information about the tool and the press line, what components, uh, geometry do we actually want to achieve? How fast are we gonna strike it? With how much force is we gonna, are we gonna clamp it? These kind of things. And then we have the third main group, which is tribology, which describes the frictional behavior between the material uh, and the tools in the press. All of that goes into the finite element solver. And if we have done our models correctly, we should be able to say at least somewhat clever things about these three main groups here, which is failure. And I'll get back to the topic of failure later on. Um, surface defects, where we check, well, if you have an outer panel on, for example, a car, do we have any defects that you can see? Will it look strange? These kind of things. And finally, uh, something about spring back, which uh, tells a little bit about geometrical assurance in the car. So when you manufacture the door, for example, when you then attach it to the rest of the car, does it actually fit? The focus of my research has been on this little corner up here on the topic of failure. So before moving on with the presentation, I have to define what do I mean 
with the word failure because there are two definitions of the word. There is the very commonly known uh, term fracture, which is uh, which you probably all know that when you stretch something at some point it breaks and you have two separate pieces uh, in your hand. That's a, a pretty common definition of failure. However, there is an alternative when we're talking about sheet metal forming, and that is what we call the phenomenon of necking. And necking is not where you have necessarily a, a fracture in the, um, in the component, it's something that happens immediately before, where we see a localization of strains in either a band or in a severe um, cross-section reduction here, meaning that the components lose its structural integrity. Uh, from an automotive perspective, this is the definition of failure because if this occurs in production, the part will be non-conforming and it cannot be used in a car. So for the rest of this presentation, when I mention the word failure, I will be referring to the concept of necking. So the three complex load cases that I have been focusing on here uh, in, in my studies is uh, edge effects, it's stretch bending, and it's nonlinear strain paths. But before diving into the research I've done, we need to understand why are these three in particular actually a problem? And to do that, we'll take a look at how failure is determined today in industry. The failure we determine today is uh, through the forming limit diagram. And it's a beautiful, simple uh, invention, so to say. Um, it's a, a 2D coordinate system with the principal strains of uh, the component on the, the X and the Y axis. And then through experiments, we can determine what we call a forming limit curve. That's the dashed line we see here. Now, when we then start to run a simulation or do uh, an experiment, what we can do is track movement on top of the components. And based on that, we can determine the strains. So the major and the minor strain pair for a specific point on the component. And here comes the, the beautiful part about this. If the point we determine is below the curve, we're safe. If it's above, then we are in trouble. So that's how we assess failure today. But it comes with some shortcomings, this, um, this part here. So first of all, the forming limit curve is determined through an experimental series uh, with the Nakashima test setup. Um, you can say there are three main directions that we are focused on. We have firstly the uh, uniaxial direction, which is um, where you test a specimen that looks something like this, where you have a major straining in one direction and a compression-ish um, deformation in the other direction. And that will give you a load path that looks something like this to the left in a roughly 45 degree in a theoretical isotropic material. The next one is our plane strain sample, which goes from zero and straight up. As you can see here, we've done the sample a bit wider and we get only a straining in one direction and have a zero straining in the other direction. Lastly, we have the equibiaxial tension, which is all the way to the right here. Um, and that means that we have an equal amount of straining in both directions of the, the tool. Now, due to this way of determining the FLC, we do see some shortcomings. And the major shortcoming that we see and has been seeing for the past couple of years is that this curve does not account for nonlinear strain paths. So the way we test it from zero to end, that's highly linear. So therefore it doesn't account for the impact of a pre-straining in one direction and a post-straining in a different direction. Secondly, the, the Nagashima test employs a tool radius of 50 millimeters, which means that it doesn't account for bending over very sharp radii. And we'll see examples of that later on in this presentation, what, how that impacts the uh, deformability of the material. And lastly, the samples, they fail, uh, in most cases in, in the center of the specimen here, uh, which means that we, we don't really see the uh, effect of the edges, uh, of the, the cutting and the edge effects in the specimen because we don't see failure in there. We, we see them propagating outwards from the middle. So with that knowledge, we can now move on to the research question which I have focused my research around, or in particular, the one question that I've been trying to answer. How can failure caused by complex load cases in sheet metal forming process accurately be predicted? 
Now, this is a very, very big question uh, and be very, very difficult to answer with a single uh, hypothesis. So therefore, I had to break down into three more uh, investigatable uh, questions or sub-questions, you might say. So sub-question one, how can failure caused by nonlinear strain paths be accurately predicted in the manufacturing feasibility studies? And that is accompanied by the hypothesis that a transformation of the evaluation space from the standard form diagram, which you just saw, to a space independent on load history will increase prediction accuracy. Question number two, how can failure caused by a combined bending and tension be accurately predicted? with the hypothesis that a bending correction of the standard forming limit diagram will increase the failure prediction accuracy. Um, finally, how can failure caused by edge effects be accurately predicted with a hypothesis that the inverse modeling of the ISO 16630 whole expansion test uh, to obtain a limit strain value will increase the failure prediction accuracy. So these are three questions and three hypotheses that I have taken my offset in. So, Without further ado, uh, enough with the light stuff. Jumping into nonlinear strain paths straight away. Uh, for this study, I used an industrial, uh, an, an industrial component as an example and as a case for the investigation of a transformation of the limit space. This is a first generation Volvo XC60 wheelhouse uh, manufactured from a CR4 mild steel. And with the knowledge that we just saw the forming limit diagram, by all means, theoretically, this should be safe. We don't have any um, points above the curve here. But when we then try to manufacture it, what we see is that there's not only a neck, there's actually a full-blown fracture. And looking into what actually happened here, we can go down into where we think the crack has its origin and look at the strain path. And what we'll see is that the strain path is highly nonlinear. So we even have a 90 degree turn in the strain path, and that is suspected to cause the trouble. So what I was, did was try to do a transformation based on, or do a transformation from the standard forming limit space into a new evaluation space based on the material flow direction beta and the effective plastic strain um, epsilon p up here. Um, the determination of the, the, the flow direction is uh, looking at the, uh, the, the, what do you call it, the, the ratio between the minor and the major strain rate at the end of the simulation, in the very last step of the simulation. And this is where it differs very much from the forming limit diagram. We don't consider the load history. We only consider the last step of the simulation. Um, the first study to do was to see, well, we have to do the transformation and, and calculate the effective plastic uh, strain, which means that if we have to do it the way we do it in simulation, we have to set up some numerics to iter iteratively solve for the effective plastic strain of the material model. So the first step was to see, can we actually decouple it from the constitutive model of choice for the simulation? Uh, where an initial investigation tried to compare the von Mises, the Hill 48, and the Banabic 2005. Uh, yield criteria to see would they yield similar curves, yes or no. You see the results here on the right that the, the yield surfaces of the three materials, um, the von Mises yield surface as expected performs highly different than the two others. But looking at the, um, the BBC 2005 yield 48, we see there's quite good correspondence between the two, except in the regions that describe the, the plain strain area. Then when doing the transformation here, uh, we see the same picture that the Phanesis severely underpredicts the limits and the Hill 48 and BBC 2005 is actually quite similar. Now it's not really visible here, but in this area here where you have the plain strain region, you do see a slight difference in the two curves, meaning that the conclusion of that study is that we cannot uh, decouple the transformation from this choice of constitutive model in the simulation. So moving forward with that information, what I did was take out um, five different elements of, course, of a simulation, of course, the critical element where the fracture occurs, and uh, four arbitrary control elements just to make sure that we don't mess anything up in the current, uh, in comparison to what we can do today. 
And on the right here, we see that the five elements, they give a good variety from almost linear strain paths in, in element two here to highly nonlinear paths in element four and in the critical elements. Now, when we then transform that into the new space, what we see is something like this. In here, we have the four control elements of the, um, of the arbitrarily chosen elements, and we see, well, they are still predict safe, which is good, because that is what we are seeing in reality as well. Now, turning to the critical element, what we see is uh, an, a beta value that is completely off the charts. Theoretically, this value here should not be able to pass one, as this is uh, equibiaxial stretching. But in this case, this um, ends up out here, meaning that for now, we can say that this method is 100% operational. Um, so we have to move on to other things. Next up is uh, stretch bending, where the, uh, the approach was a little different, starting out with uh, an experimental setup, which uh, looks like the one you have up here, where um, a punch with three different radii, so three, six, and 10 millimeters, was used to investigate how uh, the small radius bend actually influences the, the failure strain of uh, an AA16 aluminum alloy. Um, the setup, as you see here, was run in a, in a full-size press, so we have good control over everything. And up here, we have an Aramis DSC system to record the uh, strains as we move along. When we run these tests and identify the, the onset of necking for these particular elements here and find the maximum strain, uh, major strain value, what we see is that by decreasing the radii uh, from 10 to 6 to 3, we increase the strain in which the material fails. And for comparison, I've put in the Nagashima test here, which is the one used to determine the forming limit curve. So you see there's quite a difference between what we determine in the FLC and what is actually the reality when having to bend over a very tight radius. So I thought, well, how can we account for this in, uh, in the forming limit diagram? So this is building on the hypothesis that we can do a bending correction. And what I did was to identify this delta epsilon one value, where we take the failure strain value uh, marked with the red cross up here and identify the distance from that and down to the, uh, the forming limit curve. And what I then did was to do a constant offset of the entire curve, lifting it. And then we end up with something like this, where the dashed line is the standard forming limit diagram or forming limit curve. We have an R10 uh, test. R6 test, and finally the R3 test here on the top. Um, but in order to distinguish between when to use these curves, we need to add another parameter. So in order to, to implement this and, and distinguish between them, I chose to go with the definition of the tool curvature, uh, kappa. And by introducing that, we turn it from a two-dimensional forming limit diagram into a three-dimensional forming limit space. Now, in order to implement this into a commercial finite element software, I had to come up with some way of determining, well, how should we actually evaluate it? And there, the idea of failure measure were, uh, was introduced, where this uh, failure surface as a function of the minus strain and tool curvature is compared to the st uh, major strain at the top layer of the simulation. And this is important, that's the top layer we're working with. Um, in every element, so we can see how close is it to failure. So in order to validate this approach, um, what I did was to use a test panel uh, developed at Volvo Cars. The panel is uh, Raj Alaj, uh, 1.1 by almost 1.8 meters, which means that we couldn't run the DIC analysis on it. So therefore, a manual inspection of the panel was performed afterwards. The good thing about this panel is that it has different geometries uh, with different uh, punch steps here where different shim, shim levels make sure that uh, these different areas here have a different deformation than the one beside it. Second thing is that the tool radii are eight and four millimeters, which means that they lie without uh, outside um, the, the data model that I've used to create the bending corrected forming limit surface. Um, so 
by implementing the failure measure presented on the previous slide, we end up with something like this, where once you reach one or unity, we have a failure. And if we start comparing, the first section here is 0.9, meaning no failure, which corresponds well with the uh, real physical panel. Next, we have uh, 1.012 which corresponds well with the surface neck here, and then so forth, we identify a failure for all of the components, or all of the sections that you see up here. Now, this looks promising, but before we can say anything, we need to compare it to the standardly available tools. So comparing it to the forming limit diagram or the nonlinear forming limit diagram in, uh, in, in out of form based on the GFLC approach developed by uh, Folk, of Munich, what we see is that we don't predict a failure until we reach the final part down here, which is way, way too late. Uh, so we are not able to accurately predict the components uh, areas up here. What should be mentioned though, is that the implemented forming limit diagram in outer form will always evaluate at the mid surface of the shell element, meaning that it doesn't account for the um, strain gradients that we see through the thickness of the sheet. Good. Finally, we move on to edge cracks. And I had a little bit of a tough time with this one because the hypothesis was that by doing an inverse modeling of an ISO standardized test, well, we should be able to say something clever about the failures. However, while researching it, what I found was there was a lot of critique of the standardized whole expansion test. And one of the, the major, uh, what do you call it, critique was that there was a very, very high scatter in the results produced by the test. So moving from laboratory to laboratory wasn't able to reproduce. So the first step was to actually reduce the scatter in this test to see, can we get a stable process? And for that purpose, what I did was to come up with a hypothesis that this scatter was caused by uh, insufficient boundary conditions inside the test. Um, so what I did was to take the tooling from a standard Nakashima test, where we have some physical draw beads that would ensure firm clamping of the material during deformation. Now, a secondary benefit of using the Nagashima tool as also used for the, uh, or the setup also presented for the stretch bending is that we also introduce 3D DIC cameras. So we can now actually track the process. Um, by the introduction of these draw beads, we need to control the process a little more because the ISO standard specifies that we should cut a specimen with a hole of 10 millimeters. But when we then start to form the draw beads, what will happen is that we're going to do a slight expansion of the hole or a pre-expansion of the hole. Um, so we did a, an experiment without the punch, just seeing, well, how much would this hole actually expand? And what happened was that it expanded from 10 to 10.047 millimeters, which seems insignificant, but as the output of the hole expansion test is the hole expansion ratio we are interested in, where we use the initial diameter as a calculation base, we just want to make sure that everything was done rigorously, that we were sure that of every parameter in the, uh, in the test was uh, ensured. Now, as I said, a secondary benefit of doing it this way is that we now have the 3D DIC cameras. And another thing that has been suspected to cause the scatter in the test is that it's the highly operator-reliant post-processing -post -post process of the uh, experiment. Here's the, they find that the operator manu uh, operating the press should manually terminate the test as soon as they hear a through thickness crack in the sample. And they should afterwards measure with sliding calibers, the whole opening here, two measurements perpendicular to each other. And, and that's what we use as the calculation basis up here. Now, by introducing DIC, we can't use the strains. We can't see the recorded strains because we can't measure that close to the edge. But what we can do is obtain the images to identify the exact stage where we have the through thickness crack. What we see here on top is um, a stage where we have the onset of a surface failure. You see the crack hasn't propagated all the way through the thickness yet. And down here, we have the second or uh, later stage where the crack has propagated through. 
the difference between these two images is 0.17 millimeters in punch displacement. And if we assume the same crack propagation rates after, we can see we can do quite some damage if the operator is um, just a second off lifting his finger off the press. So already by introducing this, we can more accurately say when have we actually determined the, the, the through thickness crack. Now, secondly, by having the photos, what we can do is to do some um, pixel mapping inside a software. So instead of having to measure with sliding calibers, we can do some, some measurements inside softwares to see, well, how many pixels are there in these two cross sections or two diameters that we're measuring. And then we can compare it to a known reference length to get the actual distance between the two. And based on that, we can find the diameter of the sample. Um, because we have a 3D DIC system, we have two cameras, which means that we now have four diameters. I had to alter the, uh, the expansion ratio uh, expression a little bit, where we find this uh, whole ex expanded whole diameter averaged over here, and then we keep the rest as we want, and we multiply by 100 to get it into a percent-wise uh, increase. What I did was then to run 62 uh, tests of the whole expansion to see, well, these changes, did they actually reduce the scatter? And the question is, absolutely not. Um, what we see here is that there is still a lot of scatter. We see here from test 47 and onwards, a downwards trend in the results, um, which I at this state can't explain. Uh, it could be due to friction changes in the experimental setup. It could be a result of a Punching, pros, uh, punching tools settling into a stable condition, something like this. So this needs uh, further investigation. Moving on to the conclusions here. What, we, what I found was the three sub-questions and the overall statement. And I would like now to address all of them individually. So for the first sub-question about nonlinear strain path, I tested out this transformation of the forming uh, limit diagram to a new evaluation space. From the presented results, we can say that it works, but I would like to say we shouldn't discard the hypothesis immediately because the reason for that alpha or beta value being so far out of the theoretical space is most likely to be found in the 90 degree turn of the strain path. So before we understand what is actually happening in that 90 degree turn, we can't disregard the hypothesis or discard the hypothesis. And therefore on this, uh, what do you call it? Stoplight sign, it gets a intermediate yellow. It's neither a go or a no-go. For the stretch bending, um, I pre presented the bending correct and forming limit surface, which proved to perform better than the existing models mm -hmm. in outer form. So the hypothesis, that was presented and has been confirmed that by doing a bending correction to the forming limit diagram, we can actually obtain a more accurate failure prediction of these cases. Moving on to the edge effects, um, I would almost say, no, we haven't done anything to prove or disprove the hypothesis because focus slightly shifted to trying to reduce the scatter in the test rather than doing the inverse modeling. But the study that I presented here does raise some, some very valid questions. First of all, when do we actually evaluate the test? Because in every other aspect of sheet metal forming, once you have a through thickness crack, that's way too late. In an industrial setting, way too late. So why actually determine it at the through thickness crack and not at the onset of the surface fracture, which we are now able to do with the setup, um, with the 3D DIC setup? Um, finally, the you know all statements. Well, I didn't solve all the world's problems here uh, with the methods that I have presented today. I've raised some good questions. I have presented one good approach here that we can surely say, well, that improves everything. So I think the overall statement to paraphrase my, my supervisor here, we are still confused, but on a higher level. As what goes for the future of uh, sheet metal forming and for my research uh, in particular, um, there are two approaches to it, of course, the short term and the long term uh, views on this. So short term, um, the first step to do is to do a proper investigation of this uh, beta epsilon uh, 
P approach or the transform space that uh, I presented for nonlinear strain path. We might have been a little bit too ambitious by trying to do it on an industrial component from day one. So let's now try and bring it back in in an experimental setup where we have a little bit more of controlled settings and see what can we get from it there. Next is, of course, to determine failure strain for the whole expansion test to see can we actually prove the hypothesis that I posted in, in the beginning. Um, then we also need to do a reiteration of the, uh, of the wheelhouse with the knowledge that we obtain from the investigation in the controlled settings to see, well, what knowledge do we get here? What can we apply here to actually get something accurate? And finally, for the opinion correct formula of the surface, I need to do a validation for more industrial cases. This was in a very nice environment setting up in, in, in an experimental setting. Uh, so let's see what happens when we try it out on actual components running in production. Now, on a long-term basis, um, the sheet metal forming community is uh, rapidly moving because a lot of things are happening in, in the area. And uh, just with, as with any other business line, Machine learning and AI are the new uh, buzzwords. So definitely one thing to look at was to see how can we actually apply machine learning for fracture detection, for example, in, um, in either in the experimental setup or, or in an industrial setup. There has been some preliminary story, uh, studies conducted at ETH in Zurich to see how we can use uh, machine learning to identify cracks before the visual eye or that the eye can actually uh, see it. The next big thing is what we call material testing 2.0. Going back to the introduction that I gave, there is a high demand for new advanced materials, sustainable materials, green materials. And as the number of materials increase in industry, we need to perform more testing. That is both not good for the environment because we are wasting a lot of material uh, doing the, the testing, the whole test series, and of course, it's a very, very expensive process. So if we can somehow figure out a way to do smarter testing through full field uh, analysis, virtual field analysis, and design some experiments that targets more than one information that we're after at one time, we should be able to save both material and money. Finally, um, going back to machine learning, uh, we talked a lot about failure limits today here in the presentation. And again, an initial study from Zurich has shown that it could potentially be possible to actually determine both linear and nonlinear forming limit curves with the aid of neural networks and machine learning in uh, general. So before I completely wrap up today, I have a few people I would like to thank. Uh, first of all, of course, the uh, industrial partners that has been a part of my work here uh, for the past two years, Volvo Cars, Research Institute of Sweden, SSAB, Alpha Laval, Scania, Volvo Trucks, Autoform Engineering, and uh, Vinova, the uh, Swedish Innovation Foundation. I'd also like to thank my supervision team and uh, my colleagues for the steady support throughout my couple of years here. And lastly, of course, uh, my family and my friends for their support throughout my, my PhD journey here. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. We will now take a five minutes break. We start again at 10.45. So let's start with the discussion. And before I give the words to you, a short note to the, those of you in the audience that are not familiar with the academic world. Don't be alarmed. There could be some uh, real tough discussion here. And I really hope for that, but it's not a problem. That's a way of part of the proceeding. So please start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for these kind words. I know Barlow to be a pleasant guy, and I consider myself a pleasant guy, so I will not get into fight. <laughs> so just to make that clear. And also, now we are recorded, so it's <laughs> <laughs> for the past that we do something which is not suitable. So. 
And uh, thank to Matt, Tobias, and ETO for inviting me. It's my first appearance here at BT8. Uh, but uh, Matt, I've known for quite some years. I think back in April 13, 2004, it was Matt who was wearing the blue tie. I think <laughs> it was a tie with Ludo. So, but it was a good experience. Yeah. At, at least to me. Yeah, to me too. Okay. Okay. Then I'll start with one complaint. Okay. Uh, and you, it helped a little from the morning because <laughs> I had a paper version. And uh, mm -hmm. at least there was a preface, a uh, first page on front page on the, the thesis because uh, the PDF I've been looking at for the last couple of days. Yeah. I was desperately looking for a, a nice front page. Yes, um, every, everything had to be a little bit fast uh, when we send out the invitation. So uh, there's some coordination with libraries and so on, but here we have it. Okay. And uh, first of all, congratulations on completing your, what's called a sweet slick thesis. Yes. This thesis uh, was it. It's one milestone out of many. So, <clears throat> and I only have a few slides, and it's just to make a little bit converse <laughs> for my uh, company, so you can hopefully be remember it. Uh, this is one of our young guys who completed his PhD uh, during this uh, time. Uh, we are a small company, but we are like Volvo, striving very much to move into a more academic point of view on what we are doing, because we believe that is the future. It's done. Oh, that was a nice picture. One of the things we are doing is, or the only thing we are doing is that we are producing coolers and especially the charts air coolers. And uh, <clears throat> that is of course of interest to me, but it's also of interest to Barlow, I think. And it's very much related to the topic of Barlow's uh, dissertation uh, here. <clears throat> and what we see here is a corner of a cooler typically used on a ship. And we have the airflow into this side where we have a lot of uh, copper plates, very, very similar to the cooler in front of your car. Uh, a close view of the uh, plates. These tubes are 10 millimeter in diameter, but we have a hole in all our plates and we punch the hole and at a certain time we expand the hole exactly like it's done in the uh, conical test of uh, yeah, ISO 16630. <laughs> okay, and that was the title of the thesis, but we have seen that. Uh, and that is part in our manufacturing process where we stamp these plates one by one, and then we stack them maybe two meter high or something. Uh, and uh, this is of interest because Bali is growing older and he has some history. And uh, back in 17, he made a project at our company. Uh, at that time, I was the supervisor for Bali. And uh, what we see here is the simulation of the forming process, where we start from a flat strip, have five forming operations, a punching and a coloring operation. So, so it's somehow pretty advanced in the simulation. 
And here we have from one of our material vendors some problems with cracking of our plates, uh, which leads to a lower performance for the cooler. And of course, we struggle a lot to overcome this problem and our material vendor do whatever he can to improve the quality of uh, the ingoing material. Do you remember this figure? Oh, it's been a while, but I think it's uh, in coil variation of uh, mechanical properties. It looks like. Yes, I think there are four coils and it's the variation between, between yield stress along X and tensile strength along uh, y axis. That's quite some noise. Yes. Okay. If we look on your thesis, where do we see some noise? Well, we see it uh, all around um, because, as this image perfectly describes, that is that whenever we have a coil, there will be a certain amount of variation within it. And then, if we take a step back and look at it from even from batch to batch from the material. Uh, manufacturers, then we could see even larger differences. And it's something we really don't take into account right now, because we do samples from a certain area of the coil, and then we set this down and say, well, this is a representation for the entire coil. So you, you have it, but we don't really address it, not in the, the work that I've been doing here right now, um, but it is something that is of more and more concern, especially with the material, advanced materials that we're seeing today where we start to see an increase of uh, recycled materials into the, the mix of the coils that are going out, then we have an even larger uncertainty than probably what we see here uh, between the mechanical properties of the material. Okay. This example goes for the uh, stress mm. the yield tensile. Uh, would you expect the same in the field of uh, friction? It's a good question. Um, I th think you'll see some small variations in terms of friction because the, the surface of the sheet might be slightly different. Um, what I do when I run the, um, the simulations is to actually not use a, what do you call it, a column friction model. We use the triboform dynamic friction model. So we account for uh, sliding velocities, tool pressures, all these kinds of things, a little bit more advanced uh, than that. But there could definitely be a difference on the surface of the material from the different coils that could impact the, the friction. What, what kind of uh, lubrication systems is used at Volvo? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think it's just, and now I'm not sure because I haven't seen that part of the, the production that much, but it is that when you, you stamp out the, 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 the blanks and then you have them run on the conveyor through basically a, a lubrication uh, spray. So you spot lubricate some of it and some of it you lubricate the entire blank. So it's very, very highly dependent on what component you're trying to, to manufacture. Uh, how easy to control? Uh, very difficult, mm -hmm. I, would, I would guess, yeah. So I, I would expect quite some noise in the lubrication uh, as well. Yes, and absolutely. And I think this is, this is one of the studies that I'll be conducting afterwards, after defending here. It's looking into how the combination of variations in blank holder forces and lubrication amounts on sheets uh, influence the geometrical assurance of uh, components in production. So I'm not quite sure yet, but hopefully come back to me in a couple of months and I'll be able to tell you a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, uh... The Volvo way of uh, pressing mm -hmm. is typically yet that you cut a rectangular blank of a certain size. Maybe you cut yeah, the corner and then you have a, a number of steps mm -hmm. and then uh, you may have a final yeah. calibration cut or what is uh, called. Uh, what about the quality of the first? Uh, cutting operation? Well, first, uh, a slight correction, because I don't think that all of them are cut just as rectangular. They are doing 
tailored planks to reduce uh, scrap amount. So I think that will help a little bit on uh, the first step here. Uh, but of course, the, the first trimming operation is always a little bit uh, tricky. Oh, shit. Okay, let's let's take a tailor plank. Yeah. Then it means we have two at least two pieces welded together. Yeah, uh, that's when you have that tailor. What I talk about is a specifically designed uh, plank. So you stamp out, you trim out the plank. Yeah. Yes, okay. yeah, sorry. <laughs> but if you take a, a tailor plank yep. with two or more parts yep. welded together. Mm -hmm. Then uh, for each weld line, you will have two cut lines from the two parts put together. Yes. Could that be of relevance for some of your work? Yeah, of, of, of course it would, because as you see, uh, the, the cutting process being used more and more, you probably see some sort of, of tool wear. Uh, and if you start to see a wear in the tool and we don't can't really control the, the process parameters uh, anymore, we might see a slight misalignment in the two cut parts, which means that we, we have a slightly, I don't know, I won't say crooked part, but they might not be perfectly aligned anymore. Or, um, of course, depending on the weld that you're using to, to weld them together, you could also have a, a, an instability in, in the in, in the itch because you have a micro cracks from from the cutting operation that could potentially cause problems. Okay, in your thesis, you refer to an author who investigated uh, some of the effects of, I think you call it pre-straining or yeah, yeah. of the ends. Yes. When they have punched yep. the quality mm. and they, then they have a I think a milling, milling process to yes. so, uh, remove the purse. Yep. And uh, I don't remember the numbers, but uh, for mild steel, you see a big difference in the values. Yes. And then you have a stainless steel 304, mm -hmm. where the improvement is smaller from punching to milling. Yeah. Could you give a potential, potential explanation on that? Uh, well, I think, I believe one of the, the answers to that question could be, of course, the material properties itself. And without going deeply into the, the, the field of fracture mechanics, what, uh, what is stated as the cause for, for these differences is not necessarily the burrs, but actually micro cracks in the, in the thickness generated by the punching process. So maybe the, the stainless steel has a larger uh, prop, uh, crack propagation resistance than the, the other material we're comparing to. Um, that could be one explanation for it. I, I think one, maybe wrong, but I think one explanation could be that the most ductile material, and in my world, it's a measure of the end value of the material, mm -hmm. often can lead to a poor quality in the cutting process. And <clears throat> then even that it should have a better formability and crack resistance uh, is not that improved mm -hmm. because the quality of the cutting uh, becomes poor. Yeah. Uh, and you state that according to the norm, mm -hmm. uh, that if you make a cutting to produce the uh, 10 millimeter yeah. uh, hole in the sheet, yes. then you should be within, you should have a, a clearance of the dye of 12% uh, of the thickness. Yeah, plus minus two percent, depending whether you're above or below two millimeter sheet thickness. Yes. yes. And uh, now, in in my world, you saw the yep. the, fin, the fin plates. Uh, uh, they are point, uh, point uh, twelve or point eighteen uh, wow. thickness. Uh, do you think it's realistic to? Oh, then, uh, that that might be a little bit too fine to to get that accuracy on on, on that uh, that sheet. 
of course, what, what should be stated about the, the whole expansion test is that as any other ISO standard, it should make everyone happy. Uh, so even a 12% cutting clearance could be too high in, in even this test. But in order to, to satisfy everyone, they have taken that number and said, well, this is what we're doing. There are several other studies uh, from Stuttgart, for example, the, the, the department of Professor Liebald, uh, that has shown that a 5% cutting clearance is um, way more robust when you start to see tool wear than a 15% cutting clearance, for example. So the process uh, of, of the hole punching is, is very, very dependent on the, the punching process, of course, uh, and the state of the tool that you're using to punch the hole. That's, that's one of the things we're struggling with. And, uh, these holes, I think we make around 25 billion holes a year. Uh, so just to maintain our tools in order to avoid some of the, these problems is, uh, uh, is quite time consuming. And uh, uh, you say something on scrap rate is one issue, yeah. but also the problem of non-conforming yeah. parts or non-conforming processes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, it's a big problem because if we cannot rely on everything running, it must be the same at Volvo. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole expansion itself hasn't been directly tied to Volvo. Um, the whole expansion test, of course, send, uh, focuses around uh, around hole being expanded. If we look at edge effects from, from the automotive industry, what you more see is, is on the, when you do a I don't know if you should call it a flanging operation, but you, you, you bend down and then you do some stretching. So you have a split of a, a, a straight edge instead of a circular edge. Mm. That's the majority of the problems that I have encountered in, in the automotive industry. Um, we don't see that. Mm. I, I have an example. I think that's even better. Um, the problem you see with edge effects in, uh, in industry is that it looks something more like this, that you have a crack on the straight edge here. So we don't see the problems with the edges. So it's when we do a flanging operation down here and then do a, a post straining operation on, on that flange, that's when we see the cracks appearing here in the automotive industry. Whereas the, the ISO standard, well, it's it's been around for years and it's used by everybody to characterize the, the edge formability of the material. So my initial thought with this was to, well, let's try to start there. This is what everyone uses basis and then work out from, from there. Are you familiar with the uh, terminology of uh, shrink flanging and stretch flanging? No, I am not. I haven't worked too much with uh, flanging. <laughs> so when you have the flange going down, yeah, and depending on this shape, yeah. whether it's this way or yeah, this yeah. way, yeah. Uh, in one situation the material will be compressed, right. yeah. and the other situation the material will be stretched. Yes. Uh, and I think that this cause is because we have the stretching of the materials. Yes. And I think it's, I'm not sure it's here that the stretching is most severe. I think it comes from this part, but the preforming yeah. of this one uh, may be, of, be a cause of it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it could very well be that uh, that's the culprit here. Um, can you handle this? Now you have the FLDs, you have stretch bent FLDs, you have curvature corrected FLDs. Um, both yes and no, I would say. Um, because if the, the bending correct forming limit surface that I presented is when we start bending over radii. This, I think this is a little bit more of a different case because here we don't really have the strain gradient through the thickness, and that's really kind of what the, um, what the bending correct and formula even surface is targeting. What we should do here is more likely look at, uh, again, going back to what Professor Liebel and his team has been doing in, in Stuttgart, I believe it is, to look at this Diablo test to see, well, what happens when we actually stretch the, uh, the edges of a sheet that is cut for a specific purpose, purpose, and then we need to control our variables. We need to be sure what is the state of our cutting tool what is the cutting clearance? Because that will have a major impact on it here. And then when we have some sort of experiment where we can 
do an inverse modeling or do a DNC analysis to get the limit strain here, um, then we can say something clever about it. Then moving on to the next problem, well, what failure mode is this? Is, is this something that experience uh, a neck or is this a direct fracture phenomenon? Mm -hmm. That's the, the next thing you have to, to look into because you can probably- be let's, let's say it's not a neck. Oh, it's a full bone fracture then. Um, then what I would probably do is to, to run the, one of these C-tests analysis in the same material, trying to mimic the, um, the cutting clearance um, of the, the industrial setup, and then identify, of course, the initiation of crack in, in the experiment at the stage before, look at the, uh, the major strain value to identify a, a uh, or the maximum major strain to identify a, a limit strain value. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can take that and use as a, I would say a flat, uh, it's a flat limit throughout the entire forming limit curve because what you see here in, in the edges, if I remember correctly from what I've read from literature is that in almost all cases, what you see here is a uniaxial tensor, a uniaxial direction that you see when you have a failure near the edge this way. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you use a flat limit, then that could most likely capture it. Okay. Oh, um, I met uh, Paolo once more back in 14 or 15, where he was a pretty young guy. And uh, at that time, he worked on similar stuff, uh, forming limit diagrams determined by a specific uh, method, uh, and also with the digital imaging. Yes. Uh, and uh, that's quite fun because in the preface you write something that we could join your journey or yeah, something yeah, exactly. this, uh, and your journey has been a little bit more than three years here in four years uh, here in the ETH. Uh, so it's almost been eight years uh, where you've been in the field of uh, metal forming. Okay. Now, should have a, a little breeze. So, some days ago, I started preparing a bit serious uh, for today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried something that I have never done before. Okay. I tried to use a chatbot ah. to see if I could, uh, could generate some uh, good questions. <laughs> And uh, I try to ask what is uh, forming limit diagrams. And uh, I don't know if you agree on that. I'm going to take a step back and take a look at it. Uh, look pretty okay. Yeah, I, slight modifications would be quite good, yeah. Okay, we'll also take this one. That's also from Chetpot. You, you are referring to academia. Yes. yes, that's the way to go. Yes. Uh, is there some good reasons to use a Nakajima test? I know Volvo prefers it. Yeah, but, uh, you can say the, the Nakajima test is, uh, has been around for, for, for many, many years. So over the years, I, I certain knowledge on how to run it uh, has been built up. The EX test has been around for even longer, probably. 100 years, I think. Yeah, probably. Um, but I couldn't tell you why you prefer one over the other. What I can tell you is that there is an alternative to these two, which is the Masenyak test. Mm -hmm. And in, in my mind, yes. uh, that could probably be the ultimate one, uh, the, the best way to do it, because what you have in that is in the area of a region of interest where you measure the strains, you don't have tool contact. So it's a pure material test. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> we'll not uh, go into it. Okay. Uh, but we could take the year and test. Yep. Uh, you mentioned, you also did today, that one explanation of the scatter mm -hmm. is that the operator should year by year, yeah. uh, when we have the uh, fracture. Mm. Uh, 
for example, a standard Ericsson test, then you would have the uh, maximum force if achieved before fracture, and you'll have the force at fracture measured. And I think pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. So, but okay. Now, this jet, but it's, it's just for fun. So, uh, I never tried to use it for something serious. <laughs> That's good. That's fun. It's a first. Now, is it boring? <laughs> then I think I'll switch to some more. What's it called? Naughty questions. All right, let's kick it up a notch. <laughs> uh, you have uh, printed four papers. Yes. Excellent papers. Okay. Preview papers. Yep. I, I, I didn't say excellent. You said. Ah, so I say excellent papers. <laughs> you said excellent papers. <laughs> and they have been previewed, etc. and yeah. uh, been published at uh, conferences. Yes. Which conference was the best? Oh, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, personally, I like the uh, Forming Technology Forum uh, setup. That uh, it's 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 a very small conference, so you you have time to go see what what is happening because there's only one session. There's not really a parallel session, at least the one I attended. So I I like that. And then of course you have the IDDIG. Okay, you think that's IGTRG? Yeah, IGTRG is a form and uh, FTF. That's the three that I've been uh, publishing. How many Danish people were there at IGTRG? Oh, that was actually, no, that was easy form. Uh, me? <laughs> there was not a lot of people there. Did you attend the, uh, the formal meeting of the national delegates? Mm, no. Was that a thing? I was not aware that that was a thing. Many years ago, I attended IDTRD yeah. together with my old professor, mm -hmm. and he took the one day off at the conference, <laughs> so I could participate in the delegate meeting, because it means that on your CV you can write mm -hmm. that you have been national delegates. Mm -hmm. That's smart. <laughs> I'll remember that. We have an idea of Jean Lulo coming up here in June. <laughs> <laughs> So back to the papers. Mm -hmm. Now we have been around the conferences. Which paper is the best one? I personally like uh, paper B you see in here, which is the presentation of the bending correct forming limit surface. I think um, that became my, my baby uh, because that was rooted in my master thesis back in the day. Um, you also seen today, it's uh, the, the only approach where we actually have a uh, verdict works, doesn't work. So I kind of like that one. That would be my favorite. Can, can you find the figure where you have uh, a sketch of the uh, punch test? The, um, right, you have a sketch with a three, six line. Yes. Three, six, seven, seven, seven. Yeah, give me a second. Uh, first one. And I just need to go and steal the screen back from you here. Yeah, I guess this is the one. Okay. First step is we claim the tools. Yep. And then we press down the, the tools of a rigid punch. Yep. And then, because the punch is uh, not placed symmetric, yes. it took me several minutes to figure out. Uh -huh. So when you make sketches, it can be a good idea to use center lines as we used in, used in the good old days. Right, right. So, so people can figure out. In, in the beginning, I thought it was a mistake. Oh, yeah, okay. No, no, this is uh, fully intentional in, in this case. So we have, in the beginning, a straight strip. Yep. Then it goes down. Mm. It means we will have some bending at the draw die shoulder. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> then we will have a straight piece mm. of blank material. Yep. And then we will, on top of the ponds, have Punch 
contact. Yes. We could characterize the point contact with an angle. Yes. We have 10 degrees contact growing to 15 to 20, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it goes up and this bending contact mm -hmm. grows. Mm -hmm. In other words, we may have the tool curvature mm. at a certain place, but then we will have a zone going from tool curvature to straight sheet. Yes. How to handle this with your curvature corrected setup? Well, I mm, let me think. Um, so the way the method is set up is to identify the um, what you call it the uh, the maximum strain in the specimen here. Mm -hmm. If we take the R10 here as an example, the reason the whole reason for the punch being offset to one side and having uh, both a major and a minor curvature is to ensure that the fracture is located at the same place every time. And the, the failure strains that the method is based on is actually right in this transition that you're talking about. Because when we run the experiment, what we see is that, if I can get these to sit together, is that the fracture starts here, just on the very shoulder of the punch, and right in this transition zone. So that is how we kind of, how to say, account for, for, for this that is right in the transition between the two that we're taking the values. Okay. When you deep draw a cup, mm -hmm. then you will see that you, you form the bottom of the cup mm -hmm. and then if severely formed, you almost get into a 90 degree yes. straight walls. Yep. And my experience is that you will always see the failure at the exit of the punch nose. Could very well be, yes. And also, uh, now I close down the machine yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, But that's, if you have a failed experiment, mm. it's normally because the material fails yeah, at, over the, uh, at the yeah. exit of the trivet. Yeah. Okay. Now, if METS was to produce a component like this, mm -hmm. which is uh, made by the stretch bin. Yep. Then uh, he will have the clamping, and then he will have a linear punch. Mm -hmm. And if it's a front vendor, mm -hmm. uh, what would he do in the, the final step uh, of the forming operation? Well, he will trim away some, some excess material, and then, of course, release the forces. I mean, you'll have to little bit of the step before trimming. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're going for here. I, I think it's that there's a general rule that they want to stretch, for example, with a fender, one percentage or something in that magnitude mm -hmm. in the final states of the forming All right. to reduce problems with the uh, spring back and uh, okay. I don't know. Have, I was uh, not aware of that. Better fitability or something. I was not aware of that. Okay. But that could also be of interest in this because if you have the bent form mm -hmm. and then you end up with the stretching, mm -hmm. uh, then I'm sure you will see exactly the same kind of uh, thinning of the material. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, absolutely. And then you can throw in the, the, the next part of the mix is that now we are splitting up operations, meaning that we have multiple steps in the training. So we also jump into nonlinear parts. So let's, let's jump to these nonlinear parts. Yeah. Uh, I think you had the, uh, the uh, I think it was, was it a wheel cover where you had the, yes. you had the, the jump. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, here you see it. Okay, now it turned red. Yeah, it's, uh, so, this is plotting. Yeah. Well, the, the version I read, it, it was blue, I think. Yeah, I, uh, I had to fix a little bit there. Uh, I looked a little bit on this. Yes. 
and uh, uh, one of the questions coming to my mind is uh, how is the simulation set up in uh, what's it called out of form out of form yes, yes. Um, this is uh, the heart of the matter you can say um, because it all relies on the way that simulation software actually tracks the, the strains. Um, if I can uh, go to the board over here, I think it's easier to draw a little bit. So what we see in, in the path here is that you have some sort of deformation uh, and that's roughly plain strain. And then whether if it's due to a change in the process step where you rotate the component and start stretching in the other direction, I'm not entirely sure of. But what should in theory happen is that the second part that you see here that goes horizontally is should in theory be going straight up. But due to the software having determined that the major strain is in one direction and the minor strain in another, so it keeps that throughout the simulation. And then we end up in a situation like this. So the problem we're facing here is probably tracking the strains because once we have decided that there is a print, major principal direction, it, it keeps, stays on, uh, keeps on to that. So essentially what is happening here in the simulation software is that major is changing to minor and minor is changing to major in, in reality, but it, it's not tracked in simulation software. Um, that must be a problem. It, it definitely is a problem. Um, and, and that's why we also, uh, best TV kitchen style, uh, have started a little study uh, on this, you know, pulling this back into an experimental, um, experimental control setting. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, uh, here, let me just, that's the one. Uh, so this is for a uh, paper targeting IDDIG and Lulu this year. And uh, what we did was try to reproduce what is what is happening over here by doing some sort of freeze training, in, in this case, in a somewhat uniaxial direction. And then we trimmed out Nagashima specimens um, where we have uh, what is four specimens cut out in the same uh, direction as the, the initial pre, um, what do you call it? Initial sheet was formed. So transverse to the rolling direction is the forming operation. And then we took one that was longitudinal. So nine degree turn to um, in the plane strain area here to what we actually see in, um, which is what we see here. And what we found that with running DIC and everything, in order to get this behavior, as you see down here, for the nine degree turn, we had to flip the major and the minor. So we're not quite certain that what is happening in the wheelhouse is that we are doing some sort of deformation with this changes in direction with respect to the rolling direction. And this is really not good for the simulation because if we go back and look at the definitions of the generalized forming limit concept, for example, that the, the advanced formability in out form is based on, one of the requirements is that we don't do that. We cannot do that. We're, we aren't allowed to do it. <laughs> um, but but you, it must be possible to extract the uh, strain increments or the resulting strains as function of time. Uh, and yes. Then you can just take uh, the XY and uh, the shear strain, uh, and then you can elaborate on them afterwards. Absolutely, but I think the, the main concern here, of course, uh, with, with Matt sitting as an industrial uh, actor, is that if we can do, if we have to do post processing in a third party software now, that's going to take a long time. So it, it has to be within a commercially available software. In terms of research, well, that is what we're doing. You see all the, the, the plots here. We've, we've taken out the strains, we tried to figure out what is up and what is down. Um, but in terms of, of implementation, this needs to be handled in a single software for it to make sense for the uh, CAE departments around the world. Okay. Now uh, we heard about your baby paper. Yeah. Uh, what is the worst paper? <laughs> the worst paper? <laughs> uh, 
I would say that's the one that precedes it. It's paper A, uh, which is served as a pre-study to paper B, where I presented the, um, the stretch bending. Why, why is it the worst? I think for for me personally, through with the journey that I've been on from, from starting a, a thesis work at Volvo back in, when was that, 18, 17, 18, something like that, um, to coming here to now, the, the, the contents of paper A from a scientific point of view is maybe not as strong as the three other papers. I mean, of course, there's scientific rigor. It's it's correct. Everything that's in there, it's good. But what it investigates is more of a survey of the existing space rather than trying to address a problem. Okay. And I learned one thing from reading your thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the topic design research yeah. methodology yes and uh, one of the starting points there is uh, you should consider if it's worthwhile doing this yes absolutely have you considered that for paper a or for a general for paper a and uh, the other papers it's it, it is absolutely uh, worthwhile because if i try to jump to a different slide here um, and take a look at the design research methodology. You can see that paper A, um, what it's really all about, or was about, was to figure out, so what are we doing today? Why isn't it working? And what can we do to make it better? So paper A was looking at the available options in the commercial final element software, see, well, can we capture it with the three or four different failure prediction methods that was in there. So it didn't propose anything new, but it was worthwhile for me and also for the community, so to say, that we can say, present information saying, look, this is what you have available today. This is what you're doing. But here we have a case you cannot accurately predict, which means that we have told the community that there's something here that you need to be aware of making it worthwhile. I think in that situation uh, with paper A, maybe I would have spent more time on uh, existing publications yeah. to see whatever attempts people have made more than just to rely on uh, yes. yeah, what is implemented in the software. Yeah. Uh, being worthwhile, it should be academic worthwhile, mm -hmm. it should be practically worthwhile and it should be uh, realistic yes okay when i do research mm -hmm. uh, i have a very high thoughts on many things mm -hmm. and uh, i never use the term realistic because if it's real research i don't know what is the outcome no but i think in, in the terms of the realism at least as i interpret it from from this method it's, it's also about well, are we proposing something that is completely off the, the rocker here? Maybe not within mechanical engineering, but go to some more um, deep investigation or deep research field like uh, astrophysics. If someone comes up and say, oh, I want to make a black hole here in my laboratory. How realistic is that? It, it, I think it's more in, in terms of that sense that we're talking about realism. And then, of course, you have some, some bounds within where you, you're located saying that, okay, maybe, okay, I need a full press line, uh, but where can you fit one? Do you have the money for it? Is it realistic to do these kind of things when you're doing your research? Sure. No, I thought it was realistic in relation to have a useful result of... No, I think that's more the insurance of the, the practically, it practically being worthwhile because you can do a lot of research and then you can go and say, sure, we did a lot of theoretical mumbo jumbo, but if it's not something we can uh, transfer into a practical use, then what's the point? Well, it could be academic benefit. It's yeah, of, of course, it, it could be of academic benefit, and it depends on what field you're, you're, you're doing. But I think as we are mechanical engineers, what we strive to do is to do something that can be transformed into something that can be put out into the real world. Uh, that should be a priority, uh, at least from, from, from my point of view here. Okay, today is the first day. Yes.
and uh, tomorrow is Friday. And I don't know if the Swedish name is the same for Langfreda. Uh, uh, <laughs> Langfreda. So maybe we should continue for a long time, then we could make this to a long toast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Uh, you have a figure, you are so proud of that, you bring it uh, twice on page 8 and page 9. Uh, of the thesis or the presentation here? Thesis. Uh, twice? Oh, okay, yeah, I, I, it's uh, tables. It's uh, these you're talking about. No. No? Wrong page. It's 14, oh, yeah. 13 and 14. Okay, yes, that is the uh, impact model. Uh, let me see, did I bring it up here? Yes, just so everybody can see it. It's this one. Um, yeah, that, that lies to the, um, the, the DRM re, uh, methodology. What initially you do is try to sit down and do a survey of, well, where can I actually what will my research benefit? So I'm located here in the middle, uh, the failure model energy. That's what I'm trying to do. Where's your paper? My paper. Um, they are located here, here, and here. So this is on the contribution to knowledge on nonlinear strain paths, stretch bending, and edge effects. So this year is more to, to take a step back and look at the upstream impact of the research you're doing. Um, the second image you, will, uh, you refer to is the same figure where this down here is green and this up here is, is red, where I started. Right, right. So in terms of the research I'm doing, this is where I'm focusing my efforts. I don't focus on looking into so what exactly is doing to the upstream impact. Immediately now, I'm looking at these three knowledge fields and how it contributes to the failure model accuracy. Yeah, one thing I wondered was that you were switched it all to red and uh, in the argumentation for mm -hmm. uh, the papers and also the first part of the thesis is uh, lightweight, green, or all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are up here. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely correct. Uh, it's correct, uh, it's uh, lightweight time. materials. Yeah. And, and you don't affect it. No, no, I affect it. I think that's the, the, the difference between the two models. When you talk about the red and green, it's not that we don't affect what we do affect. What I'm talking about is the focus of my research area. I don't focus specifically on introducing lightweight materials or don't specifically focus my research on uh, time spent on, on uh, non-conforming parts. So that figure is there to illustrate that this is where the main focus of my research will be. This is then just to illustrate that we I'm aware of the upstream impact that my research has. If you have to argue with uh, Volvo or Metz or yep. BS on something, uh, then you need to argue up in the red field Absolutely. instead of uh, down here, because uh, yes. only Metz has an interest in forming limit diagrams. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Volvo is more concerned on quality and profit. Time to market, all these kind of things, yes. So I'm, I'm fully aware that we, we should keep this in mind. And that's the entire motivation for doing the, the research that we're doing. It would be interesting if we should have a cake or we should have cake and beer. That's <laughs> <laughs> any discussion on that, yeah. Are there some topics you would like to discuss? Oh, that's a very luxurious question. Uh, I think we can uh, actually take a look at the, uh, the edge cracks, because just as with the um, just as with the nonlinear strain path, I have been doing some TV kitchen style uh, preparations here, and again targeting IDG two thousand and uh, and twenty three in, in Lulu. And as I stated in the presentation, what we're doing is introducing three DDIC into the whole expansion test setup. And this here is an illustration of why can't we just use DIC as it is. As you see, when we run the test like, like this, we get the strange field across the specimen. 
But zooming into the center here where we actually have the region of interest, um, we lose our data information on the color where we are actually interested. So what I thought about was to see, well, I know there's still a high scatter. Let's take out 11 samples of the 62 that I presented earlier and then see what would happen if we do an inverse modeling of those 11 tests. So first of all, I, I set up a, a find element simulation and just to check that we're not completely off. Uh, we start out by doing a comparison of the force displacement curves. So simulation uh, experiments, quite good on the, um, on the corresponding between the force and displacement developments. Uh, here we have some failure on the experimental and the simulated value. They are slightly off. And this comes from what I call a binning operation. So when in order to not run very, very, very fine steps on the simulation, we are running uh, implicit code. Um, then uh, in the setup here, I said that, well, every half a millimeter of punch displacement, you dump the data. You are having a very big step in your simulation. Uh, what one millimeter? No, I think this is just uh, this is just axis. This is uh, just because I took it out into MATLAB. The, the the axes are not representative of the actual simulation. Yeah, I think the step size is half a millimeter. The step size is half a millimeter. It's, it's seen when the steps go from there to there. Okay, that's one here. Yeah. So you have a step size of half a millimeter. <laughs> okay. Can, can you go back to one of the images? Uh, no, two questions. Yeah. You, you state that if we go 50 millimeter in displacement, mm -hmm. then we have the problem with the uh, image system. Yes. Why? But that, that is simply because what we see here, that when we have the, uh, the color forming up, it's get out of focus. As you can see here, we, we can capture the strain fields on the, the color that's going up. For some reason, the 3D cameras doesn't capture near the edge here. And, and that's the problem that we have. So you can see we do, we, we, we do proper good uh, strain fields on the entire test, except in that area we're actually interested in, which is kind of a bummer. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why we can't use the DHC. How is it set up? Uh, we have your cameras. On top of the die, uh, so it's it's been conducted at the research institute in Sweden's location in in Ullström in a hydraulic press, and in the the die parts you have the Aramis system mounted on top. So what we're looking at here is actually down through the die opening. So it's uh, it's during yes. the operation. Yes. So it's it's not an Argus, it's a uh, it's an Aramis. So we capture the strain for with a sample frequency of sixty hertz. Okay. Now you measure uh, the diameter of the hole also by uh, digital means, yep. and you use uh, I use this opening here as a reference. As the reference. Yes. Uh, how do you handle the three D effect in the height? That is also something that we have started discussing afterwards. Okay. That is something no, that's not, so not fully it's accounted just, for yet. It's just that I can uh, I, stop wondering. Yeah, yeah exactly. We, we haven't done that yet, but I think we're moving a little bit. We are moving away from that because there is a discussion. Well, this whole expansion ratio, what, okay. can, we, what can we use it for? Okay. If you were to do it all over again, what yes. would you do then? Well. What I would have to do is to take a look at the displacement of the dice to in relation to, to the punch. So the, the setup here is that the, the punch is stationary and then you move the, the dice. So I think, I think in, in general, not just for the, uh, this experiment. Oh, okay, in, in so, general, okay. oh, that's a big question. Uh, whew, that's a very good question. If I should do everything again, I would probably do a lot of the same things because we have been doing very interesting things here in my time uh, with, with BTH. Um, okay, I think we should stop with this. Uh, can you find page number one of your thesis? Page number one? That will be that one. Okay. Yeah, page number two. Page number three then. This one. The acknowledgements. Oh, this one. 
Aha, the, the quote. Can you put that on? Uh, on fair enough. Uh, I can read it. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that would be my final yeah. question. Hold <laughs> on, my own quote. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, thanks for your answers. Thank you very much. And congrats. Now it's almost lunch. But yeah, yeah, exactly. You can see what comes from the audience. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kobayan. Then we open up for questions online. Who would like to um, start? Don't be shy. <laughs> Doesn't look like there's any questions. No. Anyone here in the room that would like to answer a question? Same to you. Don't be shy. Mats, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'll you. <laughs> Good. So first of all, thanks for the great presentation. So it gives a superb, like steady introduction in, in, the, in the difficulties that we are facing today. Like you took a step by step, I really appreciate it. So thanks for that. Now, um, uh, there's two things, the nonlinear strain paths and the, um, and the uh, focus on edge cracking. And for me, as an industrial guy, it means you are trying to push the boundaries of uh, the steels that I'm that I'm able to work with, right? So by making the method more precise, I can take more risk or use a more difficult kind of steel. Yes. Um, do you think like? What kind of steels then? Because now the question is, uh, what kind of steels then are we? Uh, looking at in the future that are real difficult to form that are not possible today. So not possible in terms of the uh, uh, component shape or not possible in terms of risk. Like, do you think about Martin Zittig steels or try to get rid of, uh, for example, heat uh, treated, so hot formed B pillars? What kind of components and steels are you thinking on, uh, let's say, pushing the boundary on? I, I think it, it, it might not necessarily be on the material itself. Of course, there you have the, the whole demand that we are switching to sustainable materials. And when we talk about sustainable materials and cheap metal forming, we know that means one thing, and that is increase the amount of scrap in the, uh, in the coils that we are getting. Then we can go in and have the further discussion. So the first cycle where you have an amount of scrap from the, the previous time, well, that we might be able to handle, but looking in 20, 30 years in the future, well, what happens to the material that was manufactured from scrap now going into a coil as scrap again? Um, how will that impact the uh, mechanical properties of the material? We, we don't know that. So in order to be able to be safe for that and do the testing, we need to control uh, quite accurately how we, we use uh, these kinds of materials. The second part of it, and I think Volvo, Cars is an excellent example of how customer demands has driven um, companies to make more complex car bodies. Because if you remember back to the Volvos in the 70s, it was a box on wheel. It isn't today. They have very nice curves and they're looking very aesthetic. And it could be that only becomes even worse in the future that we see very, very complex, even more complex component geometries um, with weird, uh, not weird, but with complex load paths in them that we need to account for. Um, so it's not necessarily the material alone, but also the demands driven by customers. Yeah, uh, understood. Right, so you want to go further in terms of, uh, let's say, more adventurous designs that you would, uh, that you would allow. But personally, but that's just uh, my own wish um, I, I saw somebody from Saab even in the in the in the participants. So Saab was one of the companies that made hot forming uh, reality with the side impact bars. Now, what I would love to do is make these uh, out of uh, steel, like very super high strength steel, without the, the hot forming or the heat treatment at all. And perhaps that, that will be possible then with the technologies that you push. Could could very well be. Uh, one could hope. 
All right. Okay. Thanks for the presentation again. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, you're yeah, saying by we hear you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to listen to this presentation. It has been very, very academic, very nice, very well explained, and super duper interesting in the topic and, and the challenges. Yeah. So first of all, good luck with the challenges, because as far as I see, you want to tackle almost everything. Non-linear strain path, edge fracture, uh, bending effect on necking, almost all of it, yeah? So yep. good luck. Okay, uh, I have a couple of questions that maybe could be interesting for you, but questions, suggestions. When you, In the case of the wheel arc, mm -hmm. uh, basically you took from the experiment, uh, uh, I guess, let's say an issue, some wheel art that was supposed it was not supposed to fail but it failed in the trial and yes. then you reverse engineer it to have a look on why why did it fail no? or what what did happen in that failing area um mm -hmm. did you have the chance to get uh some uh argus measurements at different drawing depths you know to be able to be sure experimentally how the strengths evolve during your part in your in your experimental part Unfortunately, no. Um, this was a component that was an industrial case that comes from before my time up here. So it's a, it's a case that Volvo has provided. Uh, they have fixed issues in, in production and we can't kind of reproduce the problem now. So unfortunately, no. Okay, okay, yeah, because a lot of the times, as you know, uh, we have apples and bananas, and we really want to, we, we, we really want to be sure what is the real strength paths that our paths are following to, to, to later be able to do a good reverse engineering, you know? Yes. Okay. And the second comment is <clears throat> edge fracture is something super complex. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you show us with your 60 or 50 something experiments, yes. even if you do it right with a lot of care and a lot of love, you still have a lot of scatter on it. Yeah. Yes. Um, did you think on switching to other edge fracture experimental testing that they are, they are not under still or not yet under ISO standards, but maybe they can lead you to less scatter? That's the first question, sorry. And second one is you, I guess that you, as far as I understood, you punched the surface, no? And maybe that's why you have that decadency of the whole expansion. Um, did you consider uh, using maybe YEDM to establish at least one first more or less similar roughness? And the third one is instead of using a 3D um, measurement system, what about trying to use a 2D measurement system with one single camera on the top? Like this, you avoid you avoid the problems of uh, that the that the jury asks you about the depth of focus. So yeah. you still can keep the depth of focus. And as you have a flat, known round flat shape on the top of your punch, if you could have a second one there uh, at a different height you could even get uh, real diameters, you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. All right, so tackling the, the first question here, it was about if I tried other techniques, right, or other experimental setups. Yep. Um, for this, no. I am well aware that there are others out there, and there are probably others that are better suited. Um, one of them could be the KWI test, going back to what we've discussed before, having a pure material test, no contact between the whole edge and the tool. The reason for going with the, the whole expansion test is, as said, it is the ISO standard. It is what most material suppliers are doing uh, to, to, to uh, what do you call it, deliver the um, certif certificate to, to customers. So therefore, I tried to look into this one because it is by far the most you know, commonly used in, in, in that sense. Um, then I lost you a little bit on the second question. Can you please repeat that? Yep. 
Um, don't really remember which one was about the all I gave you, but uh, so the first one was to use a different testing. Uh, the third one probably was to use the cameras, yeah. just one single camera. And the second one was to homogenize the, at the end, edge fracture is really dependent on the edge quality. And that depends on the cutting method. When you're punching, you always have some issues, more depending on material and so on. If you go to wire EDM cutting, um, you are almost assure a really similar and good edge quality. So at least you will avoid you will avoid uh, scatter coming from the edge quality, let's say. Yes. Okay. Um, the only problem doing that is that if we should use the ISO whole expansion test as uh, intended, as an input for a material card saying something about the material, right? We can't really do that because we, if we do a, a wire cut of the hole, we have, as you say, significantly increased the quality of the edge that we have cut meaning that that's not how it would look in production. You don't wire cut all your, your, your blanks in production, meaning that we would just polish up uh, the, the results that we have seen and create an even bigger gap between the experiments. Yeah, 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 no, no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to change uh, the ISO standard to be oh. wire cut. What I mean is right now you are taking the ISO standard mm -hmm. to check uh, edge fracture using the whole expansion ratio. Yep. And with that tooling and so on. And then you are trying to do some modifications and some learning basically on why do you have that scatter. And if it if and um, and then that will lead you to, to have a really good accuracy on the measurement. Yep. So my proposal is for doing that first step on really digging deep into the test and seeing where are those dis discrepancies coming from and so on. You, ah. you do the whole work with a really nice, perfect edge fracture. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, nice, perfect edge quality. Mm -hmm. all, all the same, almost the same in all experiments. Yep. And once that you have the test under control, then you move to the punching. Yeah? You move to the shear cutting. Like this, you know that if there is a scatter, it's coming from the differences in the edge quality. You know, they are not yes. coming from the methodology. You first validate the methodology, and then you move to the next step. You increase the, the complexity, you know? Yeah, OK. Now I get you. Yeah, I, I fully agree that's, a, that, that's an approach to take to, to make absolute sure that the scatter is not caused by the, the, the punching process itself um, or the the majority of the, uh, the, the scatter, uh, there will always be a little bit of scatter with the, with the punching process, I think. Um, but, um, but definitely noted that that could be an, a, a way to, to, to bring this in. And then to, to, to address your, your third question with the, the single camera, it's, it's a very good idea. The, the reason we did it as we did was that the, the placement of the cameras in the die was something we had already. So we didn't need to modify any tooling. So it was simple just using what we yeah. had. Yeah, 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 it's good. And my last comment maybe is related to a comment that you said on, okay, look, when we're talking about FLCs necking, we don't go to check the crack that is coming out of the localized necking, but we go one step ahead and we say, look, localized necking itself without cracking is not good. Mm. But when we go to fracture, the current standard says that you have a crack that goes from the whole thickness, which I know that as it was you doing the best. It's not so easy as it looks. I mean, you start going from one picture to the other, and then you say, oh, well, I will say that that picture 35, I have a full crack. You know, it's, it's not always that clear when do I have a full crack. So you also said, oh, maybe we should even go one step ahead, no, and avoid the full crack of the thickness. Yes. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure of, about that because if I have a component in where I have a local necking mm -hmm. without fracture, uh, that's not only aesthetically if it's an outer panel, aesthetically it's wrong, but even if it's an inner panel or inner component. Uh, Structurally, that's a that's an issue. Yeah? yeah. While most of the issues or most of the problems that I see on edge crack is not the, the main issue is not really having that a small crack on the tip, is when that thing propagates. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. either you have a door or you have an edge. So the issue, the real the real industrial problem is when that thing propagates. While 
in Nekin doesn't need to be go to fracture, yeah. Just the the, the necking itself is an issue. So I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure if we should go one step before in this one. Okay. And yeah, that's that's all from my side. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, probably we will see each other in ISA four FTF and IDD this year. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> we will keep discussing about it. Thank you, thank you. Oh, very good. Thank you very much. Do you say about? Uh, so here's Roald Lingbeek again from Outlift to, to jump in on your on your last comment. So I, I much support what you just said. So the problem is not just whether a crack comes, but whether it propagates, yes or yes or no. And uh, the, perhaps we should look more in the direction of the of the dent test, the DENT, to see uh, to check on this uh, crack propagation uh, properties. But then uh, coming back, perhaps uh, 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 maybe Alexander, you could show again the the, uh, the uh, statistical spread on the whole expansion, the slide you just showed before. Yes, second. Far back uh, here. Yeah, and this is a very interesting slide, and one I see these kind of results I see a lot. Um, like if you see this amount of spread, just thinking purely from a statistics point of view, you wonder what kind of value you can actually talk about in the first place. Now, imagine yeah. I would go to one of the people of SSAB or Tata here in the meeting room and I, I negotiate a, a steel specification. What limit would I set, 20 or, or 30? Mm. Or would, would they be willing to take that kind of risk? And I think the overall spread in whole expansion is so big that we, yeah, we, we, we tend to get in very difficult uh, discussions. Absolutely. It's, uh, it, it's, it's definitely the, the root cause of, at least from my study here, that it's difficult to, to, to quantify any you know, formula limit. It is that, well, if we don't have control of the process where we determine this limit, how can we actually determine the limit? So it's, it's, it's definitely something that's uh, causing a lot of trouble. Yeah. Do, do you have ideas on other tests? Uh, did you try something like uh, uh, finding the TFS or TTS values or doing whole tensile tests? Or did you check on other things like not just well, whole expansion tests? I, so I, we initiated a study on an open whole tensile test. Um, I don't have the results ready analyzed, uh, but that's definitely something we, we have been looking into. Um, we have also talked about, as, as uh, I mentioned earlier, that the KWI test could be something. Here we can really uh, employ the, the DIC system because we don't have as such an out-of-plane out deformation of the hole in the same way as you do in, in the whole expansion test, which could give us better conditions for uh, doing measurements on, uh, on the region of interest to see what, where we end up and possibly also make it easier to, through digital tools, measure the... Um, the diameters, uh, if we wanted to, to determine the whole expansion ratio for, for this test here as well. Cool. Yeah, thanks. It, it's interesting. I want to put some pressure on that. So Outlive is making safety components like seat belts and airbags, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a crack entering the component in a, um, in a production scenario, like in a deep drawing, uh, then it's not nice because you have scrap. Yes, but we're making safety components that are in a crash situation very heavily loaded. If I have cracks walking into the component, this means uh, somebody is standing right next to my desk asking what's going on very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, thanks for the comments. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, I normally always have the last one, but unfortunately, <laughs> you stole it for me and <laughs> made it better. <laughs> so by then, I leave the word to the examiner to take a decision on cake and beer or just beer. Let's see. Oh.
put this here for now. <laughs> you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation. And also, uh, I think, uh, a good discussion led by Carl Brian. Thank you very much for that. Also very interesting to see so many people joining online and in the room. Uh, it's quite nice to see that, which means there's a good interest. And I understand why, uh, because you have done thorough work in, a, I would call it a classic area and where there's still a lot of challenges. I mean, we're moving to new vehicles and people think like, you know, all the classic stuff will go away, but that's not really the case. There are still going to be crazy designs and uh, they need to be able to hold together. So it's a quite interesting area. And then when we're looking at uh, the actual graduation, I mean, there is the coursework you have to perform, you've done the coursework, and then it's writing a licentiate, which is this licentiate, and of course, present it. So, I mean, the formalities with having an opponent, that's to create a good discussion for the audience to listen in and to have the, have a, the, the possibility to also present your view on things. It's a kind of mini dissertation before the PhD. So that is actually the formalities. And then we did add one more formality, and that is the actual measure of it. <laughs> yeah. So I actually put that slider into uh, the 10 millimeter position. So now I think you'll have to measure to see if it fits. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yes. <laughs> How happy I am, because otherwise we would have to fail you. <laughs> uh, but having said that, again, uh, excellent work. And I have here the signed certificates. These are the copies. So the real copies, the, the real uh, ones are handed in. So you get the credits and you are done with courses. So you're done with the dissertation. So let me be the first one to congratulate you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, my name is Johan Wall. I'm the head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at BTH. So on behalf of BTH and the Department of Mechanical Engineering, I'd like to congratulate you to your work. Very well done, Alex. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure following your journey. I'm looking forward to what's following in the next step. So congrats. Well, well done. Thank you. And And before we move away, so could we also get down supervisors? And if someone could be kind enough to snap a photo too, good on tree. Put that one in, in the black, I think, so it's easier. You won your win also as head of the park. Oh, yeah, I found also. Do we all fit? <laughs> it would be nice to have a picture from here. Check on the new Come forward. Yeah, because your oh. face has this. Um, <laughs> my presentation on my face, nice. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Uh, I think I'll just pack down my computer and then uh, I'll bring it up to the office. But I have to go get the beer. I have to read.